Hi, I'm Mark Schmidt from the Mission and Outreach Committee. The Christmas Fund has been caring for active and retired clergy and lay employees of the United, United Church, Church of Christ, Christ for over 100, 100 years, providing, providing emergency, emergency grants, supplementation, supplementation of small annuities, and health premiums, and, and it's a way at Christmas to say thank you for your service, service to the Church, church especially, especially those retirees with a lower income. income. Over the, the past nine months, months because, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic, the emergency financial needs of many of those who serve the Church have increased dramatically. The reason our Church receives this offering is because a number of our pastors have served small membership churches, churches that pay lower salaries and a lower pension fund. This offering supplements their income. The United Church of Christ sometimes draws on this offering to help retired pastors with health insurance costs. And so such, in such a time as this, the need for the Christmas fund is more urgent than ever. UCC congregation member and members have blessed the Christmas Fund with their generosity for many years. This year, your care and compassion will be especially appreciated by those servants of the church who are facing a time of need. So on Wednesday, December 16th, we will be sending out to our members an envelope that you can use to support the Christmas Fund. Watch your mail. Thank you. The What If Foundation of Haiti partners with the Narai Foundation, who runs the cafeteria for the Lamanji Food Program in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Every Monday through Friday, the cooking team serves a hot, nutritious meal to the children who live nearby. Up to 800 meals are distributed each afternoon in this community cafeteria. Each child receives a plate of fresh vegetables, rice, beans, and whenever possible, a small piece of meat or fish. Food is purchased at the farmer's market and from local distributors, which helps to support the Haitian economy. During the latest government upheaval, many people were forced to leave their homes and communities and are now miles away without permanent housing or enough income to reliably purchase food. To address this need, Narive created a food pantry where the displaced families can pick up rice and beans to cook at home. Up to 60 families visit the food pantry each week, keeping food on their tables and saving them from walking miles to the Thai Plas Caso cafeteria every day. The pandemic would set back Haiti's economic development for decades. The economic downturn has already impacted the Lamanji food program, resulting in larger lines of families coming to receive emergency food assistance at the pantry. Please help the What If Foundation keep meals, love, and hope flowing for the children of Thai Plas Caso, Haiti. Any donation from you makes a big difference in their lives. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Ryan from the Stewardship Committee of Grace Church. And on behalf of myself and the rest of the stewardship members, along with the Board of Trustees. I want to thank everyone for their pledge and commitment to Grace Church this year. It's because of you Grace Church is creating hope within our community and around the world. Thanks for, uh, again, for your pledge and commitment to Grace. Good morning, I'm Kathy Peterson. And Pastor Kim asked my husband Larry and I if we would again organize the children's treats this year for Christmas Eve. So yes, although life has changed, normal is not normal, we will be distributing the kids' treat bags at the communion service on Christmas Eve. Obviously, because of the COVID, things are very different, so Larry and I have decided that we alone will put the bags together. It was just safer to do it that way. We alone would do the shopping. So we asked the adult study Monday evenings for monetary donations. And I want to tell you the response has been phenomenal. We cannot thank you enough how you have touched our hearts. And we are having fun spending the money and getting all those sugary goods for all our children. God bless you all in return for what you have done. Thank you.
Thank you, Kathy. So uh, as Kathy was alluding to, if you um, come up here to the church on Christmas Eve between 515 and 630 at night, uh, which will be between our two services, we'll live stream at 4 o'clock and at 930. If you come here uh, to the church between 515 and 630, um, Pastor Kim and I will be outside to serve you communion in your car, and we will also have um, those goodie bags and treats and gifts for our kids. Um, so any children who, who come along uh, will receive one of those gifts, thanks to uh, Larry and Kathy Peterson and our adult study group. Um, one final announcement from me this morning, and that is um, a little bit of a heads up of what to expect for next week, December 20th. Um, next week, uh, the majority of our worship service will be our children's Christmas pageant. Um, despite the things that are different this year, we thought it would um, be good to still have our kids uh, featured in worship uh, in the Christmas play. So um, they have been uh, working hard at that already. That's all been pre-recorded um, and will be edited together into one, um, one Christmas play. And they'll, just like we've done in the past, there will be a few parts of worship service before that. We'll have um, a call to worship, a hymn, the lighting of the Advent wreath, um, a call for offering and those kinds of things. Um, but just want you all to be aware that the full service for next week, both the pageant and those worship pieces before it where we're here in the sanctuary, that will all be pre-recorded. So we will not be here at the church on Sunday morning next week. You, you at home will still access the service in all the same ways you've had before. We'll send out the emails. It'll be up on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook later, all of those regular things. Um, but we, we will not be here in the church on Sunday morning. And uh, we're making that decision for two reasons. One is that, um, and primarily because with the children's pageant being all pre-recorded, um, record, pre-recording the rest of the service allows us to upload it to YouTube beforehand, which means we'll have a better quality video um, for the, the Christmas pageant and the things that our kids are doing. Um, it'll be a better quality video and better audio for you to be able um, to connect in that worship service with our kids. And um, the other advantage that it gives us by pre-recording things next week is that there are um, a dozen or so folks who are members of the church who receive um, this worship service on DVDs and CDs because they don't have internet connection at home, so we bring them DVDs afterwards. Um, but because the full service next week is pre-recorded, they will be able to get those DVDs in advance, and the, um, those folks will be able to wa have worship on Sunday morning at the same time as all the rest of us. So that's kind of a neat thing, too. Um, so stay tuned uh, next week. All, like I said, all the same ways that we're getting the worship service now, you'll be able to get it. And uh, I hope that you enjoy our children telling the Christmas story um, because I really have enjoyed working on it this year. Uh, let us now prepare our hearts and our minds for the worship of God.
Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. In this time of anxiety and chaos, we long for God's joy in our lives. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. In this time of separation and loneliness, we long for God's love in our lives. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. In this time of fear and suspicion, we long for God's grace in our lives. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. In this time of oppression and judgment, we long for God's justice in our lives. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. In this time of sickness and worry, we long for God's healing in our lives. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. In this time of unknowns and confusion, we long for God's peace in our lives. Come, Come, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. In this time of Advent waiting, we remember God's promises. Jesus Jesus is is coming. coming. God God is is here. here. Joy, Joy, love, love, grace, grace, justice, justice, healing, healing, and and peace peace are gifts gifts from God. God that we need only to reach out and embrace. God is here. As we gather our spirits, our hearts, our bodies, and our minds to prepare ourselves for worship, let us never forget the promise of God's presence. most patient God, in the third week of our Advent journey. You alone know how how that journey is going. Did we, at the beginning of this season, promise to make this Advent different? Did we promise in our heart of hearts to prepare ourselves spiritually to receive the gift of your Son? We confess, confess, O God, God, that that we we so easily have given given in to the expectations of people and situations around us. We hold expectations within within ourselves 
of needing things to appear a certain way. We allowed the times of quiet we promised for you to slip away. Forgive us in our distractions. Help us to renew our preparations for your coming. We look forward to your promise to change things, to bring life and strength and courage to us, eyes to see, ears to hear, and tongues to speak your word. And so we wait a little longer, moving at a slower pace and with a great deal more patience. Continue to be with us, O oh Lord, as we learn to wait with you. I invite you to join your voice with mine in our unison prayer of assurance. We come, we come to, you, to you confessing, confessing what, what is on our hearts and minds. minds. We, do we do so trusting that you want to hear our petitions and that you have already forgiven what needs to be forgiven. We believe that our prayers will be answered in your time and in your almighty wisdom. Amen. creative task this the labor of people who struggle to see how God's truth and justice set everybody free people of Israel you heard the prophet tell a virgin mother will bear Emmanuel she conceived him God with us our brother whose birth restores hope and courage to children of this earth. Mountains and valleys will have to be prepared. New highways opened, new protocols declared. Almost here God is nearing in beauty and grace. All clear every gateway in haste come out in saw Jesus, a baby in a crib. This same Lord Jesus today has come to live. In our world he is present, in neighbors we see. Our Jesus is with us and ever sets us free. Soon we shall celebrate Jesus' birth. We worship God with joy in our hearts as we remember the words the angel, Behold, I bring you good news of great joy which will come to all the people. The theme of the third Sunday of Advent is joy. Please listen as I read from the psalmist. Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling. Then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and I will praise you with the harp, O God, my God. Listen also as I read from the Apostle Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, 
but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And these words spoken by Jesus. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. We light the first candle, which is the candle of hope. We light the second candle, faith. We now light the third candle to proclaim the joy of God's light. Please pray with me. As Christmas draws near, there is excitement in the air. We can feel a joy in our lives and we see it in those around us. Help us to receive the joy that comes from you. We pray that we may witness to your everlasting joy in Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning. I will be reading from the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, 8 through 14, and 17 and 18. Our scripture reading today talks about the year of the Lord's favor. This was meant to refer the year of Jubilee, as described in the Old Testament. God commanded that every 50 years, the Israelites have a year of freedom and celebration. The land would rest, debts would be forgiven, land that had been sold off would be restored and its former inhabitants, and slaves would be set free. The year, year of Jubilee was to be a special, holy land for the people in Israel. Here is a small section of the guidelines given in the book of Leviticus. Count off seven weeks of years, that is seven times seven, so that the seven weeks of years total 49 years. Then, then have, the, have trumpet the trumpet blow on the tenth day, day of, of the seventh month. month. Have, have the, the trumpet, trumpet blown throughout, throughout your land. land. On the day of reconciliation, you will make the 50th year holy, proclaiming freedom throughout the land to all its inhabitants. 
It It will be a a jubilee jubilee year for you. Each Each of of you must return to your family property property and to to your extended family. The 50th year will be a jubilee year for you. Do not plant, do not harvest the secondary growth, and do not gather from the freely growing vines because it is a jubilee. It will will be be holy holy to you. you. You You can can eat eat only the the produce directly directly out out of the field. field. Each of you must return return your family property in the year of Jubilee. When When you sell sell something to or or buy buy something from from your fellow fellow citizen, citizen, you you must must not not cheat cheat each each other. You must not cheat each other, but fear your God, because I am the Lord your God. You You will observe observe my my rules, and you will keep my my regulations, and do them so so that you you can can live live securely on the land. Thank you, Max. This morning's gospel is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 through 30. In a few moments, you will hear a reading from the book of Isaiah. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus goes to his hometown of Nazareth and during a worship service in the synagogue, reads from the Bible. The scripture Jesus reads is the same passage that we will hear from Isaiah. Listen. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord in the Lord's favor. As he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, the eyes of all the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb. Doctor, cure yourself, and you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did in Capernaum. And he said, Truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them except to the widow at Zephar in in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Ishla, and none of them were cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all the synagogue was filled with rage. They got up and drove him out of town and led them of the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. Here ends the reading of the gospel. Thank you, Larry. What I wanted to talk about here today is the idea that today is the Sunday about joy. 
Each of our four Sundays in Advent leading up to Christmas has a different theme. We started um, with hope. Last week was faith, and today is joy. Next week, the final Sunday of Advent will be love. But today's candle is joy. Um, it is always the pink candle. If you notice in the Advent wreath, we have three purple ones and one that is pink. And joy is always the pink one. So joy is a little bit like happiness, but it's also different from happiness. Happiness, I think, is that feeling that we get when we get something we want, right? Something we want. We get it or it happens and that makes us happy. And it's not necessarily just about stuff, you know, getting a thing that we want. It could be um, being able to spend time with someone or, um, you know, making someone else happy can often make us happy. Um, but happiness is that feeling we get when we get something we want. Joy is a little bit different in that I think joy is a feeling that we have no matter if we get the thing we want or if we don't. Joy is deeper than happiness and uh, for that reason sometimes it's harder to find, but if we find it we can hang on to it even when we don't get the things that we want or the things that we want to happen don't happen, we can still feel joy. Joy is like a mix of happiness and hope that we have that things someday might get better or might turn around or we might get the things that we're looking for someday. It's happiness, it's hope, it's a sense of peace and calm and faith that we trust that things will be okay, that we trust that God has us and God loves us. And all of those things kind of mix together for joy. And so as we head towards Christmas, um, Christmas is a time that there are many things at Christmas time that can make us happy, right? There are lots of little things that, that can give us that happy feeling, but when it's just happiness, it can fade just as quickly too. If we can find a joy inside us that goes deeper than the happiness, then that will last us through Christmas and beyond. Will you pray with me? God, we thank you for so many gifts that come to us through you. We thank you for hope. We thank you for peace. We thank you for faith. We thank you for love, all of these things which come to us through you. And we thank you, God, for joy, for things that make this world beautiful and make our heart and spirit sing. God, we are grateful. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you, Grace Notes, for providing our special music uh, for us this morning. It is really such a joy that even in the midst of everything happening in the pandemic, we can still have such rich and good music here for our worship service. And that group of four women have been singing together for, what is it, Bill, like 27 years? And oh, and Lucy's here too. Yes, Lucy, thank you. 28 years um, that they've been singing together. Um, so just really so, so cool. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our scripture this morning comes from the book of Isaiah. And just uh, as a brief word of introduction, the thing that I want to point out is that the first line of it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. That word anointed, um, you know, we hear in the Bible of people being anointed with oil, which usually means that oil was poured over their head. It's a symbol of leadership, a symbol that someone was chosen by God um, for that job or that role. And the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, which um, the book of Isaiah was written in, um, that word anointed is where we get the word Messiah um, from. So uh, as we look towards Jesus being born, being the Messiah, the one sent by God, Messiah literally means anointed one. And it's the same word, um, but a different language as Christ. And when we talk about Jesus Christ, Christ is Greek for anointed one. So it's that same word as Messiah. So here now, this reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 31, verses 1 through 11. And listen for a word from God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall, shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are a people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the Lord brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before the nations. Will you pray with me? Holy God, 
May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and bring you glory. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Kim mentioned some of those dates that are days that if you were alive for them, you will always remember that moment of where you were and what you were doing when you heard the news. Pearl Harbor, the assassination of President Kennedy, the assassination of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, the fall of the Berlin Wall, is one that my husband Tobin remembers, but I have no memory of. I was alive, but too young. For me, September 11th is probably the most significant date like that in my lifetime. I was in eighth grade when the September 11th terrorist attacks happened, and I can remember more about that one day of eighth grade than almost all of the other of days of that year combined. I also very distinctly remember the pre-9-11 world, so to speak, and how much our whole existence has changed because of that one day. Almost exactly nine months ago is another date on that list for me of days that I won't forget. March 15th, 2020. March 15th, 2020, our last gathered in-person worship service here in our sanctuary before the pandemic shut down. At the time, we had heard of COVID-19, but it still felt like something happening in other places, but not here. And now, here we are, nine months later, and so much about everything that we do is different. We've spoken for months here in church about how this time feels like an exile. When the people of ancient Israel, which really was a very, very small country in comparison to its big shot neighbors like Egypt, Assyria, Tyre, Armenia, and Babylon, when the people of ancient Israel that we read about in the Bible were captured by other armies, First, the Assyrians, and then a short time later, later, the Babylonian Empire. The people of Israel were sent into exile. The kingship of David's descendants ended. This kingship that they believed God promised would go on forever and ever, the line of David, it ended. King Zedekiah The last king of Judah was forced to witness the execution of his own sons. And then the armies of Babylon gouged out his eyes and dragged him in chains to Babylon. The Israelite society was broken up and stripped down. Leaders and regular folks alike were forced to leave their homes and settle in this new and strange and foreign land of Babylon. The worship of God was, if not outright forbidden, something that would have made you strange and different from your new neighbors. The city of Jerusalem, their capital city and most holy of places, was destroyed. The temple in Jerusalem, the most holy of the holy places, where they believed God's spirit itself lived here on earth. The temple was burned to the ground. And for 70 years, the people of Israel lived as captives in Babylon. Here in our lives, in these last nine months, we too have been pushed out of the life we knew, not able 
to gather together for worship and certainly not in the way we used to and not able to enjoy so many of the activities we once treasured. We have often said that this time feels like exile. And just like the Israelites in exile in Babylon, we have used our faith to hold on to hope that things one day will be made right again. Despite the pain in our lives and in the world around us, we use our faith to care for one another to gather in the ways that we can, and indeed to find new ways of worshiping God and connecting in community. These last several weeks here in worship, we've heard from the prophets of Israel, Elijah, Jonah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Joel, the prophets of Israel as they called for the people to repent return and re-devote themselves to God's ways. And though those calls of repentance have often included dire warnings of judgments coming their way from God, they have also carried grace and hope. Reminders that God is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Reminders that God has promised the people God's own presence and a better day yet to come. Today, our scripture that we read from Isaiah comes from the end of the book, the final section, which Bible scholars have often called third Isaiah. After those 70 years of exile in Babylon, another nation has risen to power. This time, it's Persia. And the Persian armies have come in and captured and gained control over Babylon. And so the king of Persia, now in control, releases the captives who are in exile. He sends the Israelites back home to Israel. Persia will continue to remain in control, both politically and militarily, but the Israelites can return home. It's what they've been longing for and pining after for 70 long, difficult years. It's what the prophets of God had promised them. They can go back home to Israel. And so the people return to Israel but things in their homeland are not the idealized image of what they had hoped for or expected. The temple is still destroyed. The whole city is still in ruins. The devastations of many generations, as our reading today put it. Returning to their homeland was not what they had hoped for or dreamed of after all those years in exile. But the devastation of the land gave them a new opportunity to rebuild. Rebuild not just the physical structures of the temple and the city wall and their homes and buildings, but also to rebuild the structures of their society to decide how they want to relate to one another and to care for one another. They had an opportunity not just to rebuild, but also to redesign, to start over, to work from the ground up, and to follow not their own plans, but God. We've talked all along in the pandemic about how it's like we are in exile. And I've heard and honestly often felt within myself this longing to go back, a hope to return to the way things used to be before the pandemic. And in some ways, it's like we are slowly going back to our homeland at least here with church. We are leading worship from the familiar surroundings of our sanctuary. And with things like the Christmas caroling this afternoon or next week's 
kids at Christmas pageant. We're working on how we can provide connections with one another, a sense of keeping up with some of our long-loved traditions, some of our homeland connections, while still finding ways to do it safely. And so it's like we are slowly coming back into our homeland, but we have not fully returned from this exile time. In truth, we cannot actually go back to the way things were. For one, it's still not safe. But even more importantly, we can never fully go back. Because if and when the threat of this illness is gone, the world has been changed from this pandemic experience. We have been changed. On the surface, when we look back at the history of the Israelites in exile, it's easy for us to expect that the exile was a desolate and even depressing period of Jewish history, forced to go somewhere else, experiencing the violence of the destruction of their holy places. And yet, actually, with the benefit of the hindsight that we have now to look back on that time all those thousands of years ago, the exile in Babylon was in fact the most productive time of Israelites' history. My Old Testament professor in seminary used to say that the exile was when the religion that we now call Judaism and the people that we now call Jewish came to be. The exile is what birthed Judaism. During this exile time in Babylon was when most of the Old Testament was written, compiled, and edited together. In exile, the Israelites came to realize that even though their armies had been defeated, God had not been defeated. Even though the temple had been destroyed, God had not been destroyed. Even separated from their homeland, even without a temple or priests or those things that their religion used to be based on, God in exile could still be worshipped. Without a king, the people came to realize that God had always been their true king. And so as we return from the exile of pandemic, and we will return, we too should not just go back. Even when the prophets call for people to return to God, it's not really a going back. We hear time and time again in scripture that God is doing a new thing, calling us forward into what's next. In another part of the book of Isaiah, we hear these words from God. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So as we return back from the exile as pandemic, we shouldn't just go back. Instead, we too, like the Israelites, have a chance to rebuild. And we too get to choose how. How do we want to rebuild those ruined parts of our lives? Will we allow God and God's ways to guide and inform and design our rebuilding? Just like the Israelites in their years of exile, these months of pandemic have been hard, but not desolate. We have learned so much so much about how to do worship and what really matters, about how to connect to people near and far, about how to build and strengthen our community together, about which things are most important in our lives, 
about how we are all so interconnected and dependent on one another. And as we rebuild together in the ruins of pandemic, we get to take these lessons with us. I'd like to return us to the scripture that I began with, written for the Israelites returning from exile and now heard by us as we look towards returning from our exile. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. God has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display God's glory. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. Strangers shall stand and feed your flocks. Foreigners shall till your land and dress your vines. But you shall be called priests of the Lord. You shall be named ministers of our God. You shall enjoy the wealth of the nations, and in their riches you shall glory. Because their shame was double and dishonor was proclaimed as their lot, therefore they shall possess a double portion. Everlasting joy shall be theirs. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants shall be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge that they are people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My whole being shall exult in my God. For God has clothed me with the garment of salvation. God has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, as a bride adorns herself with jewels. For as the earth brings forth its shoots, as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring up before all the nations. Will you pray with me? God, we are your people. Though scattered across many places, we lift our hearts in one spirit to you. As we lift the prayers that weigh us down and the joys that lift us up. God, we pray this morning for Jean as she continues recovery from surgery and for Flossie as she adjusts to life in a new place. We ask God that you be with all those who are sick or suffering. We pray for our doctors and nurses and all health workers, God, as they care for people in this time of anxiety. And we pray for the people who are in the hospital, for the people who are in nursing homes and care facilities, for all those who feel so lonely and stuck right now. God, we pray. 
We pray for those who are grieving a holiday that looks different than what we hoped for or expected, God. Give us strength, give us peace. Give us a sense of joy and love that comes from you. And we thank you, God, that we do have many joys in our lives to celebrate. And this morning, we lift up especially David and Lorian as they begin their life together. We are grateful, God, for all the ways that you give us love and joy in this world. We lift these words aloud to you, God, and now we lift others from the silence of our hearts. We know, God, that you hear all of our prayers and that no matter where our words are spoken, you hear us as we join our voices together with the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, our Father who, art who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy, thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come. Thy, thy will be done, done on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. The year of our Lord's favor is coming. The prophet says, and we await it together, a time when debts and hurts will be forgiven, when God will turn our mourning into praise. Our gifts today in this season of waiting and hope help us to strengthen one another and to offer hope to the world as we look forward to that great day of our everlasting joy. Though physically distant, we come together in one spirit to offer our gifts, our praise, and commitment to God and to work and to the work of Christ's church. I invite you to pray with me. With, with our, our gifts, gifts, dear God, God accept the, the praise and thanksgiving of, of our hearts, which rejoice in your, in your goodness, goodness and love. love. Let, Let all, all our, our gifts and all our, our lives point to your, your presence, presence in the world, and, and further, further your hope for the world through Jesus, Jesus Emmanuel, God, God with God. us. Amen.
close our worship service here together. I want to make sure um, that you all hear one more time an invitation to join us this afternoon. Um, we're having a drive-in Christmas carol sing-along here at church out in the parking lot starting at four o'clock. Um, and this past week on Tuesday, uh, we had several folks involved in it who were here, um, Don Llewellyn, Jim Rasmus, uh, Andrea Allington, Beverly Mark, uh, Bruce Sittinger, um, were all here doing a test run of all of our sound equipment to make sure that it'll all work. We're going to have multiple microphones set up, um, the radio transmitter, there'll be speakers too, uh, so you stay in your car, turn the radio to the right frequency. Um, which we'll tell you when you get here, and, uh, and you can listen along with the Christmas carols and sing along with us. Um, we'll have goodie bags, too, and special gifts for our kids. So please come and enjoy um, some time together and singing Christmas carols with us this year. Um, we know that it's the same time as the Packer game. When we planned it a few weeks ago, we were very intentional about not doing that, and then they changed the schedule on us. Um, but please still come. Uh, we, we can announce the score as we go along, if that would be helpful for you, because uh, we would love to have your presence with us here this afternoon. So as you go forth from this time of worship, go in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor everyone. Love and serve the Lord your God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the blessing of God Almighty, creator, redeemer, and sustainer of us all, be with you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.